Humoresque by Fanny Hurst. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Bologna Times. Humoresque by Fanny Hurst for the American Women's Literature Collection. On either side of the Bowery, which cuts through like a drain to catch its sewage, every man's land, a reeking march of humanity and humidity, steams with the excrement of seventeen language, flung in patois from tenement windows, fire escapes, curbs, stoops, and cellars, whose walls are terrible and spongy with fungi. By that impregnable chemistry of race, whereby the red blood of the Mongolian and the red blood of the Caucasian become as oil and water in the mingling, Mulberry Street, bounded by sixteen languages, runs its intact Latin length of pushcarts, clotheslines, naked babies, drying vermicelli, black-eyed women in rhinestone combs and perennially big with child. Whole families of buttonhole makers, who first saw the blue and gold light of Sorrento, bent at homework round a single gas flare, pomaded barbers of a thousand Neapolitan amours, and then, just as suddenly, almost without osmosis, and by the mere stepping down from the curb, Mulberry becomes Mott Street, hung in grillwork balconies, the mouldy smell of poverty touched up with incense. Orientals whose feet shuffle, and whose faces are carved out of satin wood, Forbidden women, their white, drugged faces behind upper windows. Yellow children, incongruous enough in western clothing. A draughty areaway with an oblique of gaslight and a black well of descending staircase. Show windows of jade and tea and Chinese porcelains. More streets emanating out from Mott like a handful of crooked rheumatic fingers. Then suddenly the Bowery again cowering beneath elevated trains, where men burned down to the butt-end of soiled lives, pass in and out and out and in of the knee-high swinging doors, a veiny-nosed, acid-eaten race in themselves. Allen Street, too, still more easterly, and half as wide, is straddled its entire width by the steely, long-legged skeleton of elevated traffic, so that its third-floor windows no sooner shudder into silence from the rushing shock of one train than they are shaken into chatter by the passage of another. Indeed, third-floor dwellers of Allen Street, reaching out, can almost touch the serrated edges of the elevated structure, and in summer the smell of its hot rails becomes an actual taste in the mouth. Passengers, in turn, look in upon this horizontal of life as they whiz by. Once, in fact, the blurry figure of what might have been a woman leaned out, as she passed, to toss into one Abraham Cantor's apartment a short-stemmed pink carnation. It hit softly on little Leon Cantor's crib, brushing him fragrantly across the mouth and causing him to pucker up. Beneath, where even in August noonday, the sun cannot find its way by a chink, and babies lie stark naked in the cavernous shade. Allen Street presents a sort of submarine and greenish gloom, as if its humanity were actually moving through a sea of aqueous shadows, faces rather bleached and shrunk from sunlessness as water can bleach and shrink, and then, like a shimmering background of orange finned and copper flanked marine life, the brass shops of Allen Street whole rows of them, burn flamelessly and without benefit of fuel. To enter Abram Cantor's brasses was three steps down, so that his casement show window, at best filmed over with the constant rain of dust ground down from the rails above, was obscure enough, but crammed with copied loot of Khedive and Tsar. The seven-branch candlestick, so biblical and supplicating of arms, an urn shaped like Rebecca's, of brass, all beaten over with little pox. Things, cups, trays, knockers, icons, gargoyles, bowls, and teapots. A symphony of bells in graduated sizes. Jardiniers with fat sides. A pot-bellied samovar, a swinging lamp for the dead, star-shaped. 
Against the door, an octave of tubular chimes, prisms of voiceless harmony and of heatless light. Opening this door, they rang gently, like melody heard through water and behind glass. Another bell rang, too, in tilted sing-song from a pulley operating somewhere in the catacomb, rear of this lambent veil of things and things and things. In turn, this pulley set in toll still another bell, two flights up in Abram Cantor's tenement, which overlooked the front of whizzing rails and a rear wilderness of gibbet-looking clotheslines, dangling perpetual specters of flapping union suits in a mid-air flaky with soot. Often, at lunch, or even the evening meal, this bell would ring in on Abram Cantor's digestive well-being, and while he hurried down, napkin often bib-fashion still about his neck, and into the smoldering lanes of copper, would leave an eloquent void at the head of his well-surrounded table. The bell was ringing now, jingling in upon the slumber of a still newer canter, snuggling peacefully enough within the ammoniac depths of a cradle recently evacuated by Leon, heretofore impinged upon you. On her knees, before an oven that billowed forth hotly into her face, Mrs. Cantor, fairly fat and not yet forty, at the, and at the immemorable task of plumbing a delicately swelling layer-cake with broom-straw, raised her face, reddened and faintly moist. Isidore, run down and say your papa is out until six. If it's a customer, remember the first asking price is the two middle figures on the tag, and the last asking price is the two outside figures. See once with your papa, out to buy your little brother his birthday present, and your mother in a cake. If you can't make a sale for first price, Isidore Cantor, aged eleven and hunched with a younger Cantor over an oilcloth covered table, hunched himself still deeper in a barter for a large crystal marble with a candy stripe down its center. Izzy, did you hear me? Yes, am Go down this minute. Do you hear? Rudolph, stop always letting your big brother get the best of you in marbles. Izzy! Don't let me have to ask you again. Isidore Cantor. Ah, ma, I got some rhythmic to do. Let Esther go. Always Esther. Your sister stays right in the front room with her spelling. Ah, ma, I get spelling too. Every time I ask that boy he should do me one thing, right away he gets lessons. With me, that lessons talk don't go no more. Every time you get put down in school, I'm surprised there's a place left lower where they can put you. Working papers for such a boy like you. I'll wake. How I worried myself. Violin lessons yet. Thirty cents a lesson out of your papa's pants while he slept. That's how I wanted to have in the family a profession. Maybe a musician on the violin. Lesson for you out of money I had to lie to your papa about. Honest, when I think of it, my own husband. It's a wonder I don't pot you just for remembering it. Rudolph, will you stop licking that cake pan? It's safe for your little brother, Leon. Ain't you ashamed even on your little brother's birthday to steal from him? Ma, give me the spoon. I'll give you the spoon, Isidore Cantor, where you don't want it. If you don't hurry down, the way that bell is ringing, not one bite do you get out of your little brother's birthday cake tonight. I'm going, ain't I? Always on my children's birthdays, a meanness sets into this house. Rudolph, will you put down that bowl? Izzy, for the last time, I ask you, for the last time. Erect now, Mrs. Cantor lifted an expressive hand, letting it hover. I'm going, Ma, for golly's sake, I'm going, said her recalcitrant one, shuffling off toward the staircase, shuffling, shuffling. Then Mrs. Cantor resumed her plumbing, and through the little apartment, its middle and only bedroom of three beds and a crib lighted vicariously by the front room and kitchen began to wind the warm the golden-brown fragrance of cake in the rising by six o'clock the shades were drawn against the dirty dusk of allen street and the oilcloth covered table dragged out centre and spread by esther counter nine in years in the sturdy little legs bulging over shoe-tops 
in the pink cheeks that sagged slightly of plumpness, and in the utter roundness of face and gaze, but mysteriously older in the little mother lore of crib and knee-dandling ditties, and in the ropey length and thickness of the two brown plates down her back. There was an eloquence to that waiting, laid-out table, the print of the family already gathered about it, the dynastic high chair, throne of each succeeding cantor, an armchair drawn up before the paternal moustache cup, the ordinary kitchen chair of Manny Cantor, who spilled things, an oilcloth sort of bib dangling from its back, the little chair of Leon Cantor, cushioned in an old family album that raised his chin above the table. Even in cutlery, the Cantor family was not lacking in variety. Surrounding a centerpiece of thick Russian lace, where Russian spoons washed in, washed off gilt. Forks of one, two, and three tines. Steel knives with black handles. A hartshorn carving knife. Thick-lipped china in stacks before the armchair. A round four-pound loaf of black bread waiting to be torn. And tonight, on the festive mat of cotton lace, a cake of pinkly gleaming icing, encircled with five pink little candles. At slightly after six, Abram Cantor returned, leading by a resisting wrist, Leon Cantor, his stem-like little legs, hit midship, as it were, by not sufficiently cut-down trousers and so narrow and bird-like of face that his eyes quite obliterated the remaining map of his features, like those of a still-wet nesting, all except his ears. They poised at the sides of Leon's shaved head of black bristles, as if butterflies had just lighted there, whispering, with very spread wings, their message, and presently would fly off again. By some sort of muscular contraction, he could wiggle these ears at will, and would do so for a penny or a whistle, and upon one occasion for his brother Rudolph's dead rat, so devise as to dangle from string and window before the unhappy passer-by. They were quivering now, these ears, but because the entire little face was twitching back tears and gulps of sobs. Abram? Leon? What is it? Her hands and her forearms instantly out from the business of kneading something meaty and flowery. Miss Cantor rushed forward, her glance quick from one to the other of them. Abram, what's wrong? I'll fiddle him. I'll fiddle him. The little pulling wrist still in clutch, Mr. Cantor regarded his wife the lower half of his face well covered with reddish bristles, undershot, his free hand and even his eyes violently lifted. To those who see in a man a perpetual kinship to that animal kingdom of which he is supreme, there was something undeniably anthropoidal about Abram Cantor, a certain simian width between the eyes and long, rather agile hands with hairy backs. Hush it, cried Mr. Cantor his free hand raised in threat of descent, and covering his small son to still more undersized proportions. Hush it, or by golly, I'll— Abram, Abram, what is it? Then Mr. Cantor gave vent in acridity of word and feature. Schlemmil, he, he cried, Mamzer, Ganef, Nebish, by which, in smiting mother tongue, he branded his offspring with attributes of apostate, and ne'er-do-well, of idiot and thief. Abram! Schlemiel! repeated Mr. Cantor, swinging Leon so that he described a large semicircle that landed him into the meaty and waiting embrace of his mother. Take him! You should be proud of such a little mumser for a son! Take him! And here you got back his birthday dollar. A fetal, honest. When I think of it, a fetal! Such a rush of outrage seemed fairly to strangle Mr. Cantor, that he stood, hands still upraised, choking and inarticulate, above the now frankly howling huddle of his son. "'Abram, you should just once touch this child. How he trembles! Leon, Mama's baby, what is it? Is this how you come back when Papa takes you out to buy your birthday present? Ain't you ashamed?' mouth distended to a large and blackly hollow o oh, leon between terrifying spells of breath-holding continued to howl 
All the way to Naphtal's toy store I drank him. A birthday present for a dollar his mother wants he should have, all right. A birthday present. I give you my word till I'm ashamed for Naphtal. Every toy in his shells is pulled down. Such a cow that shakes with his head. No, no, no. This from young Leon, beating at his mother's skirts. Again, the upraised but never quite descending hand of his father. By golly, I'll no know you. Abram, go away. Baby, what did Papa do? Then Mr. Cantor broke into an actual tarantella of rage, his hands, palms up and dancing. What did Papa do? she asked. She's got easy asking. What did Papa do? The whole shop, I tell you. A sheep with a baw inside when you squeeze on him. Games, a horn so he can holler my head off. Such a knife, like Izzy's with a scissors in it. Leon, I said, ashamed for Nafo. That's a fine knife like Izzy's so you can cut up with. All right, then. When I see how he hollers, such a box full of soldiers to have war with. Dollar seventy-five, says Naftal. All right, then, I says, when I seen how he keeps hollering, keep you a dollar fifteen for him. I should make myself small for fifteen cents more. Dollar fifteen, I says, anything so he should shut up with his hollering for what he seen in the window. He seen something in the window he wanted, Abram? Didn't I tell you? A fiddle, a four-dollar fiddle, a musiker. So we should have another fiddler in the family for some thirty cents lessons? Abram, you mean, he, our Leon, wanted a violin? Wanted, she says. I could potch him again this minute for how he wanted it. Do, you little bum, you chammer, mom, sir, I'll fiddle you. Across Mrs. Cantor's face, as she knelt there in the shapeless cotton-stuff uniform of poverty, through the very tenement of her body, a light had flashed up into her eyes. She drew her son closer, crushing his puny cheek again, up against hers, cupping his bristly little head in her by no means immaculate palms. He wanted a violin. It's come, Abram, the dream of all my life. My prayers, it's come. I knew it must be one of my children if I waited long enough and prayed enough. A musician, he wants a violin. He cried for a violin, my baby. Why, darling, Mamma'll sell her clothes off her back to get you a violin. He's a musician, Abram. I should have known it, the way he's fooling always around the chimes and the bells in the store. Then Mr. Cantor took to rocking his head between his palms. Oi, oi, the mother is crazier as her son. A musician, a fresher, you mean. Such an eater. It's a wonder he ain't twice too big instead of twice too little for his age. That's a sign, Abram. Geniuses, they all eat big. For all we know, he's a genius. I swear to you, Abram. All the months before he was born, I prayed for it. Each one before they came. I prayed it should be the one. I thought that time the way our Isidore ran after the organ grinder, he would be the one. How could I know it was the monkey he wanted? When Isidore wouldn't take to it, I prayed my next one. And then my next one should have the talent. I've prayed for it, Abram. If he wants a violin, please, he should have it. Not with my money. With mine. I've got enough saved, Abram. Them three extra dollars right here inside my own weights. Just that much for that cape down on Grand Street. I wouldn't have it now the way they say the wind blows up them. I tell you the woman's crazy. I feel it. I know he's got talent. I know my children so well. A, a father don't understand. I'm so next to them. It's like I can tell always everything that will happen to them. It's like a pain, somewhere, here, like in back of my heart. A pain in the heart she gets. For my own children, I'm always a prophet, I tell you. You think I don't know that? That terrible night after the pogrom, after we got out of Kiev to across the border. You remember, Abram, how I predicted it to you then. How our money would be born too soon, and not right for my suffering. 
Did it happen on the ship to America, just the way I said it would? Did it happen just exactly how I predicted our Izzy would break his leg that time playing on the fire escape? I tell you, Abram, I get a real pain here under my heart that tells me what comes to my children. Didn't I tell you how Esther would be the first in her confirmation class, and our baby Boris would be red-headed? At only five years, our Leon, all by himself, cries for a fiddle. Get it for him, Abram. Get it for him. I tell you, Sarah, I got a crazy woman for a wife. It ain't enough we celebrate eight birthdays a year with one dollar presents each time and copper goods every day higher. It ain't enough that right tomorrow I got a fifty dollar note over me from Sol Ginsburg. A four dollar present she wants for a child that don't even know the name of a fiddle. Leon, baby, stop hollering. Papa will go back and get the fiddle for you now before supper. See, Mama's got money here in her waist. Papa will go back for the fiddle, not three dollars she saved for herself. You can holler out of her for a fiddle. Abram, he's screaming, so he, he'll have a fit. He should have two fits. Darling, I tell you the way you spoil your children, it will some day come back on us. It's his birthday night, Abram. Five years since his little head first lay on the pillow next to me. All right, all right. Drive me crazy because he's got a birthday. Leon, baby, if you don't stop hollering, you'll make yourself sick. Abram, I never saw him like this. He's green. I'll green him. Where is that old fiddle for Isidore, that seventy-five cents one? I never thought of that. You broke it that time you got mad at Isidore's lessons. I'll run down. Maybe it's with the junk behind the store. I never thought of that fiddle. Leon, darling, wait. Mama'll run down and look. Wait, Leon, till Mama finds you a fiddle. The raucous screams stopped then, suddenly, and on their very lustiest crest, leaving an echoing gash across silence. On willing feet of haste, Mrs. Cantor wound down backward the high, ladder-like staircase that led to the brass shop. Meanwhile, to a gnawing consciousness of dinner hour, had assembled the house of Cantor. Attuned to the intimate atmosphere of the tenement, which is so constantly rent with cry of child, childbearing, delirium, delirium tremens, Leon Cantor had howled no impression into the motley den of things. There were Isidore, already astride his chair, leaning well into center table, for first vociferous tear at the four-pound loaf. Esther, old at chores, settling an infant into the high chair, careful of tiny fingers in lowering the wooden bib. Izzy's eating first again. Put down that loaf and wait until your mother dishes up, or you'll get a pot you won't soon forget. Say pop. Don't say pop me. I don't want no street bum freshness from you. I mean, Papa, there was an uptown swell in, and she brought one of them seventy-five cent candlesticks for the first price. Shlamiel, chamar, said Mr. Cantor, rinsing his hands at the sink. Didn't I always tell you it's the first price, times two, when you see uptown business come in? Haven't I learned it to you often enough a slummer must pay for her nosiness? They entered then on poor shuffling feet. Manny Cantor, so marred in the mysterious and ceramic process of life that the brain and the soul had stayed back sooner than inhabit him. Seventeen in years, in the down upon his face, and in growth unretarded by any great nervosity of system, his vacuity of face was not that of childhood, but rather as if his light eyes were peering out from some hinterland, and wanting so terribly and so dumbly to communicate what they beheld to brain cells closed against himself. At sight of Manny, Leon Cantor, the tears still wetly and dirtily down his cheeks, left off his black, fierce-eyed stare of waiting long enough to smile darkly, it is true, but sweetly. Giddy up! he cried. Giddy up! And then Manny, true to habit, would scamper and scamper. Up out of the trap-like stair opening came the head of Mrs. Cantor, disheveled, and a smudge of soot across her face, but beneath her arm, triumphant, 
a violin of one string and a broken back. See, Leon, what mamma got? A violin, a fiddle. Look, the bow too I found. It ain't much, baby, but it's a fiddle. Ah, ma, that's my old violin. Gimme, I want it. Where'd you find? Hush up, Easy. This ain't yours no more. See, Leon, what mamma brought you? A violin. Now, you little chairman, you got a fiddle. And if you ever let me hear you holler again for a fiddle, by golly, if I don't. From his corner, Leon Cantor reached out, taking the instrument and fitting it beneath his chin, the bow immediately feeling, surely and lightly, for string. Look, Abram, he knows how to hold it. What did I tell you? A child that never in his life seen a fiddle, except a beggar's on the street. Little Esther suddenly cantered down floor, clapping her chubby hands. Looky, looky, Leon. The baby ceased, clattering his spoon against the wooden bib. A silence seemed to shape itself. So black and so bristly of head, his little claw-like hands hovering over the bow, Leon Cantor withdrew a note, strangely round and given up almost sobbingly from the single string, a note of warm twining quality, like a baby's finger. Leon, darling! Fumbling for string and for notes the instrument could not yield up to him, the bird-like mouth began once more to open widely and terribly into the orificial O. Oh. It was then Abram Cantor came down with a large hollow resonance of palm against that aperture, lifting his small son and depositing him plop upon the family album. Take that, by golly, one more whimper out of you, and if I don't make you black and blue, birthday or no birthday, dish up Sarah, quick, or I'll give him something to cry about. The five pink candles had been lighted, burning pointedly and with slender little smoke wisps. Regarding them owlishly, the tears dried on Leon's face, his little tongue looking up at them. Look how solemn he is, like he was thinking of something a million miles away, except how lucky he is he should have a pink birthday cake. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, don't you begin to holler again. Here, I'm putting the fiddle next to you. Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. To a meal plentifully ladled out directly from stove to table, the Cantor family drew up, dipping first into the rich black soup of the occasion, all except Mrs. Cantor. Esther, you dish up. I'm going somewhere. I'll be back in a minute. Where are you going, Sarah? Won't it keep until... But even in the face of query, Sarah Cantor was two flights down and well through the lambent aisles of the copper shop. Outside, she broke into a run, along two blocks of the indescribable bizarre atmosphere of Grand Street, then one block to the right. Before Mattel's show window, a jet of bright gas burned into a jibberwock land of toys. There was that in Sarah Cantor's face that was actually lyrical as, fumbling at the bosom of her dress, she entered. To Leon Cantor, by who knows what symphonic scheme of things, life was a chromatic scale, yielding up to him, through throbbing, living nerves of sheep-gut, the sheerest semitones of man's emotions. When he tucked his Stradivarius beneath his chin, the book of life seemed suddenly translated to him in melody. Even Sarah Cantor, who still brewed for him on a portable stove carried from city to city and surreptitiously unpacked in hotel suites, the blackest of soups, and despite his protestation, would encase his ears of nights in an old homemade device against their flightiness, would oftentimes bleed inwardly at this sense of his isolation. There was a realm into which he went alone leaving her as detached as the merest ticket purchaser at the box office. At seventeen, Leon Cantor had played before the crowned heads of Europe, the aching heads of American capital, and even the shaved head of a South Sea prince. There was a layout of anecdotal gifts, from the molar tooth of the South Sea prince set in a South Sea pearl to a blue enameled snuff-box encrusted with the rearing lion coat of arms of a very royal house. At eighteen came the purchase of a king's Stradivarius for a king's ransom, and acclaimed by Sunday supplements 
to repose of nights in an ivory cradle. At nineteen, under careful auspices of press agent, the ten singing digits of the son of Abram Cantor were insured at ten thousand dollars the finger. At twenty, he had emerged surely and safely from the perilous quicksands which have sucked down whole Lilliputian worlds of infant prodigies. At twenty-one, when Leon Cantor played a Sunday night concert, there was a human queue curling entirely around the square block of the opera house, waiting its one, two, even three and four hours for the privilege of standing room only. Usually, these were Leon Cantor's own people, pouring up from the lowly lands of the east side to the white lands of Broadway, parched for music, these burning brethren of his, old men in that line, frequently carrying their own little folding camp chairs, not against weariness of the spirit, but of the flesh. Youth with Slavic eyes and cheekbones, these were the six deep human phalanx, which would presently slant down at him from tiers of steepest balconies, and stand frankly emotional and jammed in the unreserved space behind the railing which shut them off from the three-dollar seats of the reserved. At a very special one of these concerts, dedicated to the meager purses of just these, and held in New York's super-opera house, the amphitheatre, a great bowl of humanity, the metaphor made perfect by tiers of seats placed upon the stage, rose from orchestra to dome, a gigantic cup of a coliseum lined in stacks and stacks of faces. From the door of his dressing-room, leaning out, Leon Cantor could see a great segment of it buzzing down into adjustment, orchestra twitting and tuning into it. In the bare little room, illuminated by a sheaf of roses, just arrived, Mrs. Cantor drew him back by the elbow. Leon, you're in a drought. The amazing years had dealt kindly with Mrs. Cantor. Stouter, softer, apparently even taller, she was full of small new authorities that could shut out cranks, newspaper reporters, and autograph fiends. It fitted over corsets, black taffeta, and a high comb in the graying hair had done their best with her. Pride, too, had left its flush upon her cheeks, like two round spots of fever. Leon, it's thirty minutes till your first number. Close that door. Do you want to let your papa and his excitement in on you? The son of Sarah Cantor obeyed, leaning his short, rather narrow form in silhouette against the closed door in spite of slimly dark evening clothes worked out by an astute manager to the last detail in boyish effects there was that about him which defied long-haired precedent slimly and straightly he had shot up into an unmannered a short even a bristly-haired young manhood disqualifying by a close shave for the older school of her suit virtuosity but his nerves did not spare him on concert nights they seemed to emerge almost to the surface of him and shriek their exposure. Just feel my hands, Ma, like ice. She dived down into her large silk whatnot of a reticule. I've got your fleece-lined gloves here, son. No, no, for God's sake, not those things, no. He was back at the door again, opening it to a slit, peering through. They're bringing more seats on the stage. If they crowd me in, I won't go on. I can't play if I hear them breathe. Hi out there. No more chairs. Pa! Hancock! Leon! Leon! Ain't you ashamed to get so worked up? Close that door. Have you got a manager who is paid just to see to your comfort? When Papa comes, I'll have him go out and tell Hancock you don't want chairs so close to you. Leon, will you mind Mama and sit down? It's a bigger house than the Royal Concert in Madrid, Ma. Why, I never saw anything like it. It's a stampede. God, this is real. This is what gets me. Playing for my own. I should have given a concert like this three years ago. I'll do it every year now. I'd rather play before them than all the crowned heads on earth. It's the biggest night of my life. They're rioting out there, Ma. Rioting to get in. Leon, Leon, won't you sit down if Mama begs you to? He sat then strumming with all ten fingers upon his knees. Try to get quiet, son. Count like you always do. One, two, three. Please, Ma, for God's sake, please, please. Look, 
such beautiful roses from Saul Ginsberg, an old friend of Papa's, he used to buy brasses from eighteen years ago. Six years he's been away with his daughter in Munich. Such a beautiful mezzo, they say, engaged already for Metropolitan next season. I hate it, Ma, if they breathe on my neck. Leon, darling, did Mama promise to fix it? Have I ever let you play a concert when you wouldn't be comfortable? His long, slim hands, suddenly prehensile and cutting a streak of upward gesture, Leon Cantor rose to his feet, face whitening. Do it now. Now, I tell you. I won't have them breathe on me. Do you hear me? Now, now, now! Risen also, her face soft and tremulous for him, Mrs. Cantor put out a gentle, a sedative hand upon his sleeve. Son, she said, with an edge of authority even behind her smile. Don't holler at me. He grasped her hand with his two, and immediately, quiet, lay a close string of kisses along it. Mama! 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 I know, son. It's nurse. They eat me, Ma. Feel. I'm like ice. I didn't mean it. You know I didn't mean it. My baby she said my wonderful boy it's like i can never get used to the wonder of having you the greatest one of them all should be mine a plain woman's like mine he teased her eager to conciliate and to ride down his own state of quivering now ma now now don't forget rinsky rinsky a man three times your age who was playing concert before you were born is that a comparison from your clippings books I can show you Rimsky, who the world considers the greatest violinist. Rimsky, he rubs into me. All right, then, the press clippings. But did Elsas, the greatest manager of them all, bring me a contract for thirty concerts at two thousand a concert? Now I've got you. Now. She would not meet his laughter. Elsas, believe me, he'll come to you yet. My boy should worry if he makes fifty thousand a year more or less. Remsky should have that honor, for so long as he can hold it. But he won't hold it long. Believe me, I don't rest easy in my bed till Elsass comes after you. Not for so big a contract like Remsky's, but bigger. Not for thirty concerts, but for fifty. Brava! Brava! There's a woman for you. More money than she knows what to do with, and then not satisfied. Still, she was still too tremulous for banter. Not satisfied? Why, Leon, I never stop praying my thanks for you. All right, then, he cried, laying his icy fingers on her cheek. Tomorrow we'll call it a mignon, a regular old-fashioned Allen Street prayer party. Leon, you mustn't make fun. Make fun of the sweetest girl in this room? Girl! Ah! If I could only hold you by me this way! Leon, always a boy, with me, your poor old mother, your only girl. That's a fear I suffer with you, Leon, to lose you to a girl. That's how selfish the mother of such a wonder child like mine can get to be. All right, trying to get me married off again. Nice, fine. Is it any wonder I suffer, son? Twenty-one years to have kept you by me a child, a boy that never in his life was out after midnight except to catch trains, a boy that never has so much as looked at a girl, and could have looked at princesses, to have kept you all these years. Mine, is it any wonder, son, I never stop praying my thanks for you. You don't believe Hancock, son, the way he keeps always teasing you that you should have a, what he calls, affair, a love affair. Such talk is not nice, Leon, an affair. Love affair, poppycock, said Leon Cantor, lifting his mother's face and kissing her on eyes about ready to tear. Why, I've got something, Ma, right here in my heart for you that... Leon, be careful, your shirt front. That's so, so what you call tender, for my best sweetheart that I... Oh, love affair, poppycock. She would not let her tears come. 
My boy, my wonder boy. There goes the overture, ma. Here, darling, your glass of water. I can't stand it in here. I'm suffocating. Got your mute in your pocket, son? Yes, ma. For God's sake, yes. Yes, don't keep asking things. Ain't you ashamed, Leon, to be in such an excitement? For every concert, you get worse. The chairs, they'll breathe on my neck. Leon, did Mama promise you those chairs would be moved? Where's Hancock? Say, I'm grateful if he stays out. It took me enough work to get this room cleared. You know your papa, how he likes to drag in the whole world to show you off, always just before you play. The minute he walks in the room, right away he gets everybody to trembling, just from his own excitement. I dare him this time he should bring people. No dignity has that man got, the way he brings everyone. Even upon her words came a rattling of door, of doorknob, and a voice through the clamor. Open quick, Sarah. Leon. A stiffening raced over Mrs. Cantor, so that she sat rigid on her chair edge, lips compressed, eye darkly upon the shivering door. Open, Sarah. With a narrowing glance, Mrs. Cantor laid to her lips a forefinger of silence. Sarah, it's me. Quick, I say. Then Leon Cantor sprang up, the old prehensile gesture of curving fingers shooting up. For God's sake, Ma, let him in. I can't stand that infernal battering. Abram, go away. Leon's got to have quiet before his concert. Just a minute, Sarah. Open quick. With a spring, his son was at the door, unlocking and flinging it back. Come in, Pa. The years had weighed heavily upon Abram Cantor, in Avor Dupois only. He was himself plus eighteen years, fifty pounds, and a new sleek pomposity that was absolutely Ole Agnes. It shone roundly in his face, doubling of chin, in the bulge of waistcoat, heavily gold-chained, and in eyes that behind the gold-rimmed glasses gave sparkling forth his estate of well-being. Abram, didn't I tell you not to dare to— On excited balls of feet that fairly bounced him, Abram Cantor burst in. Leon! Mama, I got out here an old friend, Saul Ginsberg. You remember, Mama, from Brasses? Abram, not now. Go away with your not now. I want Leon should meet him. Saul, this is him. A little grown up from such a nebbage like you remember him, no? Sarah, you remember Saul Ginsberg. Say, I should ask you if you remember your right hand. Ginsberg and Essel, the firm. This is his girl. A five years contract signed yesterday. Five hundred dollars an opera for a beginner. Six rolls. Not bad, no? Abraham, you must ask Mr. Ginsburg, please, to excuse Leon until after his concert. Shake hands with him, Ginsburg. He's had his hand shook enough in his life, and by kings, to shake it once more with an old bouncer like you. Mr. Ginsburg, not unlike his colleague in rotundities, held out a short, a dimpled hand. "'It's a proud day,' he said, "'for me to take the hands from mine old friend's son "'and the finest violinist living to-day, my little daughter.' "'Yes, yes, Gina. "'Here, shake hands with him, Leon. "'They say a voice like a fountain. "'Gina Berg, eh? "'Ginsberg. "'Is how you stage-named her? "'You hear, Mama, how fancy. "'Gina Berg. "'We go hear her, eh?' There was about Miss Gina Berg, whose voice could soar to the tiralera of a lark, and then deepen to mezzo, something of the actual slimness of the poor, maligned Elsa, so long buried beneath the buxomness of divas. She was like a little flower that in its crannied nook keeps dewy longest. How do you do, Leon Cantor? There was a whir through her English of three acquired languages. How do you do? We, father and I, travelled once all the way from Brussels to Dresden to hear you. It was worth it. I shall never forget how you played the humoresque. It made me laugh and cry. You like Brussels? She laid her little hand to her heart, half closing her eyes. I will never be so happy again as with the sweet little people of Brussels. I, too, 
love Brussels. I studied there four years with Ehrenfest. I know you did. My teacher, Lindahl, in Berlin, was his brother-in-law. You have studied with Lindahl? He is my master. I, will I some time hear you sing? I am not yet great. When I am foremost like you, yes. Gina, Gina Berg, that is a beautiful name to make famous. You see how it is done? Gins, Berg, Gina, Berg. Clever. They stood then, smiling across a chasm of the diffidence of youth, she fumbling at the great fur pelt out of which her face flowered so dewily. I, well, we, we are in the fourth box. I guess we had better be going. Fourth box, left. He wanted to find words, but for consciousness of self could not. It's a wonderful house they're waiting for you, Leon Cantor. And you, you're wonderful, too. The flowers, thanks. My father, he sent them. Come, father, quick. Suddenly there was a tight tensity seemed to crowd up the little room. Abram, quick, get Hancock. That first row of chairs has got to be moved. There he is, in the wings. See that piano ain't dragged down too far. Leon, got your mute in your pocket. Please, Mr. Ginsburg, you must excuse. Here, Leon, is your glass of water. Drink it, I say. Shut that door up there, boy, so there ain't a draught in the wings. Here, Leon, your violin. Got your neckerchief? Listen how they're shouting. It's for you, Leon, darling, go. The center of that vast human bowl, which had shouted itself out, slim, boy-like, and in his supreme isolation, Leon Cantor drew bow and a first thin, pellucid, and perfect note into a silence breathless to receive it. Throughout the arduous fluctuosities of the Mendelssohn E minor concerto, singing, winding from tonal to tonal climax, and out of the slow movement, which is like a tourniquet twisting the heart into the spirited allegro molto vivace, it was as if beneath Leon Cantor's fingers the strings were living vein chords, youth, vitality, and the very foam of exuberance racing through them. That was the power of him, the Vichy and the sparkle of youth, so that, playing, the melody poured round him like wine and went down seething and singing into the hearts of his hearers. Later, and because these were his people, and because they were dark and Slavic with his Slavic darkness, he played, as if his very blood were weeping, the Kol Nidre, which is the prayer of his race for atonement. And then the super amphitheater, filled with those whose emotions lie next to the surface and whose pores have not been closed over with a watertight veneer, burst into its cheers and its tears. There were fifteen recalls from the wings, Abram Cantor standing, counting them off on his fingers, and trembling to receive the Stradivarius. Then, finally, and against the frantic negative pantomime of his manager, a scherzo played so lacily that it swept the house in lightest laughter. When Leon Cantor finally completed his program, they were loath to let him go, crowding down the aisles upon him, applauding up, down, around him, until the great disheveled house was like the roaring of a sea, and he would laugh and throw out his arm in widespread helplessness, and always his manager in the background gesticulating against too much of his precious product for the money, ushers already slamming up chairs, his father's arms out for the Stradivarius, and, deepest in the gloom of the wings, Sarah Cantor, in a rocker especially dragged out for her, and from the depths of the black silk reticule, darning his socks. Bravo, bravo, give us the humoresque, Chopin, Nocturne, Polonaise, humoresque, bravo, bravo. And even as they stood, hatted and coated, importuning and pressing in upon him, and with a wisp of a smile to the fourth left box, Leon Cantor played them, the humoresque of Dvorak, skedaddling, plucking, quirking, that laugh on life with a tear behind it. Then suddenly, because he could escape no other way, rushed straight back for his dressing-room, bursting in upon a flood of family already there. Isidore Cantor, blue-shaved, aquiline, and already graying at the temples. 
his five-year-old son leon a soft little powder pigeon of a wife too enormous of bust in glittering eardrops and a wrist watch of diamonds half buried in a chubby wrist miss esther cantor pink and pretty rudolph boris not yet done with growing pains at the door miss cantor met her brother her eyes as sweetly moist as her kiss leon darling you surpassed even yourself quit crowding children let him sit down here leon let mamma give you a fresh collar look how the child's perspired pull down that window boris rudolph don't let no one in i give you my word if to-night wasn't as near as i ever came to seeing a house go crazy not even that time in milan darling when they broke down the doors was it like to-night ought to be seen ma the row of police outside hush up rudy don't you see your brothers trying to get his breath from mrs isidore cantor you should have seen the balconies mother isidore and i went up just to see the jam six thousand dollars in the house to-night if there was a cent said isidore cantor hand me my violin please esther i must have scratched it the way they pushed no son you didn't i've already rubbed it up sit quiet darling he was limply white as if the vitality had flowed out of him god wasn't it tremendous six thousand if there was a cent repeated isidore cantor more than rimsky ever played to in his life oh Izzy, you make me sick always counting counting your sister's right isidore you got nothing to complain of if there was only six hundred in the house a boy whose fiddle has made already enough to set you up in such a fine business his brother boris in such a fine college automobiles style and now because vladimir rimsky three times his age gets signed up with elsass for a few thousand more a year right away the family gets a long face ma please isidore didn't mean it that way pa's knocking ma shall i let him in let him in rudy i'd like to know what good it would do to try to keep him out in an actual rain of perspiration his tie slid well under one ear abram cantor burst in mouthing the words before his acute state of strangulation would let them out elsass is elsass outside he wants to sign leon fifty concerts coast to coast two thousand next season he's got the papers already drawn up the pen outside waiting abram pa in the silence that followed isidore cantor a poppiness of stare and a violent redness set in suddenly turned to his five-year-old son sticky with lollipop and came down soundly and with smack against the infantile the slightly outstanding and unsuspecting ear mom sir he cried chamer lump ganif you hear that two thousand two thousand didn't i tell you didn't i tell you to practice even as leon cantor put pen to this princely document franz ferdinand of serbia the assassin's bullet cold lay dead in state and let slip were the dogs of war in the next years men forty deep were to die in piles hayricks of fields to become human hayricks of battlefields belgium disemboweled her very entrails dragging to find all the civilized world her champion and between the poppies of flanders crosses thousand upon thousand of them to mark the places where the youth of her allies fell avenging outrage seas even when calmest were to become terrible and men's heartbeats a bit sluggish with the fatty degeneration of a sluggard peace to quicken and then to throb with the rat-a-tat-tat the rat-a-tat-tat of the most peremptory the most reverberating call to arms in the history of the world in June, 1917, Leon Cantor, answering that rat-a-tat-tat, enlisted. In November, honed by the interim of training to even a new leanness, and sailing orders heavy and light in his heart, Lieutenant Cantor, on two days' home leave, took leave of home, which can be crudest when it is tenderest. Standing there in the expensive, the formal, the enormous French parlor of his uptown apartment de luxe, from not one of whose chairs would his mother's feet touch floor, 
a wall of living flesh, mortared in blood, was throbbing and hedging him in. He would pace up and down the long room, heavy with faces of those who mourn, with a laugh too ready, too facetious in his fear for them. Well, well, what is this anyway? Awake? Where's the coffin? Who's dead? His sister-in-law shot out her plump, watch-encrusted wrist. Don't, Leon, she cried. Such talk is a sin. It might come true. Rosy posy butterball, he said, pausing beside her chair to pinch her deeply soft cheek. Cry baby roly-poly. You can't shove me off in a wooden kimono that way. From his place before the white and gold mantle, staring steadfastly at the floor tiling, Isidore Cantor turned suddenly, a bit whiter and older, at the temples. I don't get your comedy, Leon. Wooden kimono, Leon? That's the way the fellows at camp joke about coffins, Ma. I didn't mean anything but fun. Great Scott, can't anyone take a joke? Oh, God, oh, God! His mother fell to swaying softly, hugging herself against shivering. Did you sign over power of attorney to Pa? Leon. I'll fix Izzy. I'm so afraid, son, you don't take with you enough money in your pockets. You know how you lose it. If only you would let Mama sew that little bag inside your uniform, with a little place for bills and a little place for the asafotida. Now, please, Ma, please, if I needed more, wouldn't I take it? Wouldn't I be a pretty joke among the fellows, tied up in that smelling stuff? Orders are orders, Ma. I know what to take and what not to take. Please, Leon, don't get mad at me. But if you will let me put in your suitcase just one little box of that salve for your fingertips, so they don't crack. Pausing, as he paced to lay cheek to her hair, he patted her. Three boxes, if you want. Now, how's that? And you won't take it out so soon as my back is turned? Cross my heart. His touch seemed to set her trembling again, all her illy concealed emotions rushing up. I can't stand it. Can't, can't. Take my life, take my blood, but don't take my boy. Don't take my boy. Mama, mama, is that the way you're going to begin all over again after your promise? She clung to him, heaving against the rising storm of sobs. I can't help it. I can't. Cut out my heart from me, but let me keep my boy, my wonder boy. Oughtn't she be ashamed of herself? Just listen to her, Esther. What will we do with her? Talks like she had a guarantee I wasn't coming back. Why, I wouldn't be surprised if by spring I wasn't tuning up again for a coast-to-coast -coast tour. Spring, that talk don't fool me. Without my boy, the springs in my life are over. Why, Ma, you talk like every soldier who goes to war was killed. There's only the smallest percentage of them die in battle. Spring, he says, spring, crossing the seas from me, to live through months with that sea between us. My boy may be shot. My mamma, please. I can't help it, Leon. I'm not one of those fine mothers that can be so brave. Cut out my heart, but leave my boy. My wonder boy, my child I prayed for. There's other mothers, Ma, with sons. Yes, but not wonder sons. A genius like you could so easy get excuse. Leon, give it up. Genius, it should be the last to be sent to the slaughter pen. Leon, darling, don't go. Ma, Ma, you don't mean what you're saying. You wouldn't want me to reason that way. You wouldn't want me to hide behind my violin. I would, I would. You should wait for the draft. With my Rudy and even my baby Boris enlisted, ain't it enough for one mother? Since they got to be in camp, all right, I say, let them be there. If my heart breaks for it, but not my wonder child. You can get exemption, Leon, right away for the asking. Stay with me, Leon. Don't go away. The people at home got to be kept happy with music. That's being a soldier, too, playing their troubles away. Stay with me, Leon. Don't go leave me. Don't. Don't. He suffered her to lie, tear-drenched, back into his arms, holding her close in his compassion for her, his own face twisting. 
God! Ma, this, this is awful. Please, you make us ashamed, all of us. I don't know what to say. Esther, come quiet her. For God's sake, quiet her. From her place in that sobbing circle, Esther Cantor crossed to kneel beside her mother. Mama, darling, you're killing yourself. What if every family went on this way? You want Papa to come in and find us all crying? Is this the way you want Leon to spend his last hour with us? Oh, God, God! I mean, his last hour until he comes back, darling. Didn't you just hear him say, darling, it may be by spring? Spring, spring, never no more springs for me. Just think, darling, how proud we should be. Our Leon, who could so easily have been excused, not even to wait for the draft. It's not too late yet. Please, Leon. Are Rudy and Boris both in camp, too, training to serve their country? Why, Mama, we ought to be crying for happiness. As Leon says, surely the Cantor family, who fled out of Russia, to escape massacre should know how terrible slavery can be that's why we must help our boys mamma in their fight to make the world free right leon trying to smile with her red rimmed eyes we've got no fight with no one not a child of mine was ever raised to so much as lift a finger against no one we've got no fight with no one we have got a fight with someone with autocracy only this time it happens to be Hunnish autocracy. You should know it, Mama. Oh, you should know it deeper down in you than any of us. The fight our family right here has got with autocracy. We should be the first to want to avenge Belgium. Leon's right, Mama darling. The way you and Papa were beaten out of your country. There's not a day in your life you don't curse it without knowing it. Every time we three boys look at your son and our brother Manny, born an imbecile, because of autocracy. We know what we're fighting for. We know. You know, too. Look at him over there, even before he was born, ruined by autocracy. Know what I'm fighting for? Why, this whole family knows. What's music? What's art? What's life itself in a world without freedom? Every time, Ma, you get to thinking we've got a fight with no one. All you have to do is look at our poor Manny. He's the answer. He's the answer. In a foaming sort of silence, Manny Cantor smiled softly from his chair beneath the pink and gold shade of the piano lamp. The heterogeneous sounds of women weeping had ceased. Straight in her chair, her great shelf of bust heaving, sat Rosa Cantor, suddenly dry of eye. Isidore Cantor, head up, erect now, and out from the embrace of her daughter. Sarah looked up at her son. "'What time do you leave, Leon?' she asked, actually firm of lip. "'Any minute, Ma. Getting late.' This time she pulled her lips to a smile, waggling her forefinger. "'Don't let them little devils of French girls fall in love with my dude in his uniform.' Her pretense at pleasantry was almost more than he could bear. "'Here, here. Our mother thinks I'm a regular lady-killer. Hear that, Esther?' pinching her cheek. You are, Leon, only, only you don't know it. Don't you bring down too many bows while I'm gone, either, Miss Cantor. I won't, Leon. Sotto voce to her. Remember, Esther, while I'm gone, the royalties from the discophone records are yours. I want you to have them for pen money. And maybe a dowry? She turned from him. Don't, Leon, don't. I like him. Nice fellow, but too slow. Why, if I were in his shoes, I'd have popped long ago. She smiled with her lashes doing. There entered then, in a violet-scented little whirl, Miss Gina Berg. Rosy with the sting of a winter's night, and as usual swathed in the high-napped furs. Gina! She was for greeting everyone, a wafted kiss to Mrs. Cantor and then, arms wide, a great bunch of violets in one outstretched hand, her glance straight, sure, and sparkling for Leon Cantor. Surprise, everybody! Surprise! Why, Gina, we thought you were singing in Philadelphia tonight. So did I, Esther darling, until a little bird whispered to me that Lieutenant Cantor was home on farewell leave. He advanced to her, 
down the great length of room, lowering his head over her hand, his putty-clad legs clicking together. You mean, Miss Gina? Gina, you didn't sing? Of course I didn't. Hasn't every prima donna a larynx to hide behind? She lifted off her fur cap, spilling curls. Well, I... I'll be hanged, said Lieutenant Cantor, his eyes lakes of her reflected loveliness. She let her hand linger in his. Leon, you, really going? How terrible! How... how wonderful! How wonderful! You're coming. I... you think it was not nice of me to come? I think it was the nicest thing that ever happened in the world. All the way here in the train I kept saying, Crazy, crazy, running to tell Leon, Lieutenant, Cantor, good-bye, when you haven't even seen him three times in three years. But each, each of those three times, we, we've remembered, Gina. But that's how I feel toward all the boys, Leon, our fighting boys, just like flying to them, to kiss them each one good-bye. Come over, Gina. You'll be a treat to our mother. I, well, I'm hanged, all the way from Philadelphia. There was even a sparkle to talk, then, and a let-up of pressure. After a while, Sarah Cantor looked up at her son, tremulous but smiling. "'Well, son, you're going to play for your old mother before you go. It'll be many a month, spring, maybe longer, before I hear my boy again, except on the discophone.' He shot a quick glance to his sister. "'Why, I—I I don't know. I'd—I'd I'd love to—' I'd love it, Ma, if, if you think, Esther, I'd better. You don't need to be afraid of me, darling. There's nothing can give me the strength to bear. What's before me like, like my boy's music? That's my life, his music. Why, yes, if Mama is sure she feels that way, play for us, Leon. He was already at the instrument, where it lay, swathed, up top the grand piano. What'll it be, folks? Something to make me laugh, Leon. Something light. Something funny. Humoresque, he said, with a quick glance for Miss Berg. Humoresque, she said, smiling back at him. He capered through, cutting and playful of bow, the melody of Dvorak's, which is as ironic as a grinning mask. Finished, he smiled at his parent, her face still untearful. How's that? She nodded. It's like life, son, that peace, crying to laugh its laughing, and laughing to hide its crying. Play that new piece, Leon, the one you set to music. You know, the words by that young boy in the war who wrote such grand poetry before he was killed. The one that always makes poor Manny laugh. Play it for him, Leon. Her plump, little unlined face, innocent of fault, Mrs. Isidore Cantor ventured her request, her smile tired with tears. No, no, Rosa, not now. Ma wouldn't want that. I do, son, I do. Even Manny should have his share of good-bye. To Gina Berg. They want me to play that little arrangement of mine from Alan Seeger's poem. I have a rendezvous. It's, it's beautiful, Leon. I was to have sung it on my program tonight. Only I'm afraid you had better not. Here, now. Please, Leon, nothing you play can ever make me as sad as it makes me glad. Manny should have, too, his good-bye. All right, then, Ma, if you're sure you want it. Will you sing it, Gina? She had risen. Why, yes, Leon. She sang it, then, quite purely, her hands clasped simply together, and her glance mistily off, the beautiful, the heroic, the lyrical prophecy of a soldier-poet and a poet-soldier. But I've a rendezvous with death On some scarred slope of battered hill When spring comes round again this year And the first meadow-flowers appear. In the silence that followed, A sob burst out, stifled from Esther Cantor, This time her mother holding her In arms that were strong. That, Leon, is the most beautiful of all your compositions. What does that mean, son, that word, rendezvous? Why, I, I don't exactly know. A rendezvous, it's a sort of meeting, a 
an engagement, isn't it, Miss Gina? Gina, you're up on languages, as if I had an appointment to meet you some place, at the opera house, for instance. That's it, Leon, an engagement. Have I an engagement with you, Gina? She let her lids droop. Oh, how, how I hope you have, Leon. When? In the spring? That's it, in the spring. Then they smiled, these two, who had never felt more than the merest butterfly wings of love brushing them, light as lashes. No word between them, only an unfinished sweetness, waiting to be linked up. Suddenly there burst in Abram Cantor, in a carefully rehearsed gale of bluster. Quick, Leon, I got the car downstairs, just fifteen minutes to make the ferry. Quick! The sooner we get him over there, the sooner we get him back. I'm right, Mama. Now, now, no waterworks. Get your brother's suitcase, Isadora. Now, now, no nonsense. Quick, quick. With a deftly maneuvered round of goodbyes, a grip-laden dash for the door, a throbbing moment of turning back when it seemed as though Sarah Cantor's arms could not unlock their deadlock of him. Leon Cantor was out and gone, the group of faces point-etched into the silence behind him. The poor, mute face of Manny, laughing softly, Rosa Cantor crying into her hands, Esther, grief-crumpled, but rich in the enormous hope of youth, the sweet Gina, to whom the waiting months had already begun their reality. Not so Sarah Cantor. In a bedroom adjoining, its high-sailing vastness, as cold as a cathedral to her lowness of stature, sobs, dry and terrible, were rumbling up from her, only to dash against lips, tightly restraining them. On her knees, beside a chest of drawers, and unwrapping it from swaddling clothes, she withdrew what at best had been a sorry sort of fiddle. Cracked of back and solitary as string, it was as if her trembling arms, raising it above her head, would make of themselves and her swaying body the tripod of an altar. The old twisting and prophetic pain was behind her heart, like the painted billows of music that the old Italian masters loved to do. There wound and wreathed about her clouds of song. But I've a rendezvous with death on some scarred slope of battered hill when spring comes round again this year and the first meadow flowers appear. End of Humoresque by Fanny Hurst